All right, welcome to Genscape's 2014 uh, West Summer Outlook. My name is Chris Jilka. I'm the director of the West Desk, and with me is my West team, Dennis Lucy, Ross Fessenden, and Krista Costa. And all of us will have a role uh, presenting today. First of all, everybody attending or logging in will get a copy of these slides. And also, if you have a question during the webinar, you can type it into the little dialog box on the uh, bottom right. And we'll make our best efforts to try to answer all of your questions at the very end of the presentation. So a little about the agenda for today. First, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our WECC term product. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the major events that are going to happen this year versus last year. Dennis is going to talk about supply. Ross will uh, talk about demand a little bit. And then finally, Chris will end the discussion uh, on his, with his, our view on transmission and potential congestion uh, in the West for the summer. And then we'll wrap it up. So what you're viewing right here is a screen capture or the land on page from our WECC analytical service. It's meant to be a one-stop shop for analyst traders, schedulers, real-time risk professionals, and beyond you know, what we produce for our proprietary forecasts you know, for pricing, heat rate, and demand, we've made a lot of publicly available uh, data available up on the site, and it's uh, arranged in a very organized format for ease of use and to save time in your daily process. The main table in the center is our monthly forecast versus the market for the six most liquid trading hubs in the WECC. And it can be viewed uh, for on and off peak and also toggled to display heat rates instead of prices. Additionally, you can toggle the table to look at either day over day changes or changes um, in the market day over day. And if you look on the left panel, you'll see our commentary section and we update that every single morning. We have a short-term outlook and a long-term outlook. The long-term would be um, events like uh, FERC 764, AB 32, regulatory events that happen you know, maybe a couple times during the year. Um, and then also we have our weather commentary produced by our in-house meteorologist in the same section. What we try to do is talk about any events that may have a commercial impact on the power hub prices. And all of our commentary is archived, and the majority of our forecasts are benchmarked against actuals. Now, we have over 40 different reports on this site, including proprietary hydro, solar, and wind inputs. But to save time, I'm just going to show you one example on how you'd use the system. And since this is a summer outlook, let's take a look at August SP15 contract, which in this case is highlighted, highlighted in the upper left center of the, of the screen here. The price is 5807. Now, if you click on that cell, it will bring you to this report. What this is is a 90-day history of our August SP15 contract, um, our forecast progression against the market heat rate. And you can see for the balance of the calendar year that we've basically been a half or a whole heat rate above the market for most of the year. And just recently, the two plots have crossed with our forecast now slightly lower than the market heat rate. Now, part of this move may be different assumptions from the main players in the market, which you know, we'll never know. And some of these could be changes in our internal methodology. So to explore some of the fundamentals behind this move, you would navigate to the demand section of our site. Now, using the menus uh, on the top and the drop-down menus, you could select load select the load forecast and select SP15. And displayed is our demand forecast for our entire forecast period, which goes out roughly a year. And you can see um, for the, uh, the sort of the rectangle, red rectangle in the center of the screen, your peak load does occur in August. So now what you can do is to further drill into the month of August and look at uh, what the peak load day is. And that's displayed in the upper right-hand part of your screen. And what we see is that occurs on the August 28th. 
Now, some from the, from the demand report section, now you can navigate to the generation section of our, of our service, and you go under dispatch and then stack, and this will uh, display our supply stack for that particular day. Now, in this case, we're looking at what units were dispatched from the model for the heavy load hours of August 28th. And you can see um, with the line intersecting in the middle of the, uh, the page here, um, that's demand. And where it intersects the supply stack, it's mostly CC units or combined cycle units, units which are depicted in this sort of lighter green box. You can also see a smattering of uh, CTs and pump storage also, because we're looking at an average of 16 hours, and that you would expect on a peak day in the summer. So if you want to explore that further, and you click on the light green box that says CC, um, another small uh, square will pop up, and within that you can see the uh, amount of CCs that we're dispatching from the total. Um, as well as our bid assumptions and megawatt amounts from the particular unit. In other words, you can see um, what our marginal unit is for that day. Now, this is a very quick example. Um, beyond the standard reporting that you see on the site, we run confidential custom model runs for individual clients for, on different pricing sensitivities. If you want to do a sensitivity around gas or CO2 pricing, take a transmission line out, we can do that. And most recently, Dennis has been running sensitivities on certain transmission, transmission segments that could possibly be taken out by fire, which you'll hear about later on in the presentation. So switching gears here, let's talk a little bit about some of the more major year-over-year -year changes. One of the largest ones just occurred May 1st, and that's uh, the regulatory change of uh, FERC 764 which establishes a real-time 15-minute market at the California ISO. And as I said, it began May 1st. So now all virtual bidding transactions will now settle on the FMM market and not real-time as it did previously. Internal generation and inner ties will now be priced on an equal basis, and this allows for 15-minute uh, scheduling of variable energy resources, known in CAISO speak as VARES. More granular schedules um, will have shortened forecast lead times, and this allows VAERS to curtail in response to uh, FMM market pricing. Uh, very importantly, they lowered the bid floor from minus 30 to minus 150. And then uh, lastly, um, the FMM allows for the reintroduction of convergence bidding at the inner ties. And this will start one year after the establishment of the FMM, so roughly May of 2015. And it will start with the same position limits and scheduled reduc reductions as convergence bidding at the inner ties when it was first introduced back in 2011. So the takeaway from this slide is that the CAISO is, is finally taking some steps to accommodate a high rate of renewable resource penetration. So other major year-over-year -year changes in the market are you know, severity of the drought, uh, Montana, Alberta, tie line, and SCE, PCT. And my colleagues are going to go through each of these um, in detail as we move through the webinar. So now I'm going to give the seat over to Dennis, who's going to talk a little bit about supply. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, supply factors uh, affecting WEC. Um, a lot of the ones that uh, are of major interest uh, are in California. Um, so just kind of ticking off some things here. Uh, we are looking at a pretty weak hydro generation picture in the Golden State uh, due to, uh, you know, very low snowpack that accumulated this year um, and the ongoing drought conditions in California. And it, it is interesting to note that in the CAISO summer assessment that came out uh, earlier this month, uh, they know that the, the drought conditions are actually severe enough that thermal generation in NP may actually be curtailed. And they, they put a number of about 1,150 megawatts uh, of thermal that might be curtailed uh, due to a lack of water for, uh, for cooling. So it's, it's not just pure hydro generation that might be uh, affected by the, the dry conditions. Um, on the, kind of on the flip side of it, um, we are seeing the effects of the continued uh, build out of solar generation uh, both in the utility scale uh, world and then also in terms of behind the meter solar generation. 
Um, you know, a lot of that solar generation is, uh, you know, more in Southern California and the effects of the weaker hydrogens in Northern California. So we are seeing a little bit of uh, different impacts uh, regionally um, due to these changing supply factors. And if we look at um, some of the charts from recent uh, KISO summer assessments, um, you know, we can see that in terms of operating reserve margins for this summer, uh, SP is uh, looks a little more uh, secure, a little a little greater margin than NP, and that uh, that's the first time that's been the case in uh, the last several years. Um, you know, just looking at uh, Kaiso's normal scenario for this summer, they're looking about a 28 percent uh, reserve margin for SP and a 23 percent reserve margin for NP, and in their extreme scenario, uh, those numbers go down to 15 percent in SP, which is uh, you know, fairly healthy, and then uh, under 8% NP. So a bit of a gap there uh, due to the factors I outlined. Um, this just shows some of the additions to the uh, generating stack in KISO year over year. As you can see, pretty much since Q4 of last year uh, through this summer, uh, the additions are really going to be of the solar variety. So let's dig in a little more into uh, the way we look at solar, uh, both in the utility scale and, and behind the meter, and how we uh, approach the, uh, the difficult task of modeling uh, what the solar build out is going to mean in terms of actual megawatts um, and, and the generation curve from that. Uh, what we do is we, we look at uh, new solar builds. So we, we monitor uh, projects as they're being built and as they come online. And we're looking not just at the size of the project, we're also looking at the location. And why is that? Um, our model is, uh, takes, takes into account uh, the amount of solar radiation uh, that a site receives. So that, a, you know, for example, a site in Southern California uh, would have uh, more solar radiation or receive more solar radiation than a site um, in Northern California or, or further north, further away from the equator. Um, and so then we'll use the size and the location and, and also the solar radiation intensity at the site to model the generations of, uh, of each facility and then roll it up to a, a, an ISO-wide number. So this is our forecast for uh, generation in KISO, uh, just solar generation, uh, over the next few months here. Um, and as you can see, um, th this represents like an average day uh, of each month. So uh, we, we think in June, July, August, you can see the average day having peak solar generation up around 5 gigs. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, on Monday, uh, KISO set a new uh, solar gen record. Uh, there was one hour that was 45, 17 megawatts. Uh, so we, we do expect that, that peak amount of solar generation uh, you know, to, to continue to climb and, and records to continue to fall. Uh, as we as we head through this summer. And just to kind of roll up uh, that solar the, the solar generation to monthly numbers, um, if we look at the the total solar generation of the month in, in gigawatt hours, um, we're expecting you know more than twice as much as in uh, as was generated last uh, June and July uh, for this. June and July, and overall for the months of June through September, uh, over the course of those four months, we see KISO uh, having the benefit of 89% more solar generation than they did last year. Um, for those people that are uh, kind of planning, you know, uh, what the impacts on NAT gas are looking ahead to the summer, uh, you may be aware that we are running pretty solid deficits uh, compared to last year when it comes to inventory levels, uh, both at PG&E and SoCal. Um, we, we took that increase in solar generation that we're expecting and tried to back out um, how much gas savings that would imply. So if you um, assume that uh, every megawatt of solar is displacing generation out of a, a 10 or 11 heat rate uh, gas-fired uh, generator, um, what we're looking for is uh, just just to account for the increase in solar, you're saving about six to seven billion cubic feet for the month of June and July. Uh, so that's roughly equal to about one day's worth of gas usage in, in the Golden State. Okay, so that's um, 
that's our discussion on utility scale. Let, let's dig into behind the meter because this is uh, this tends to be a little more gray in area, um, you know, with regard to uh, uh, you know coming up with the numbers of you know the actual amount of generation that's out there. Um, I, I guess the first thing that that really uh, is different from the utility scale solar build out is where uh, behind the meter is installed. Uh, so I've shown a chart here breaking out California by county, and in each county you see a pie chart, and the size of the pie chart represents the amount of behind the meter uh, solar uh, installations there are uh, in that county. Um, and as you can see, there, there is quite a bit in Southern California, uh, San Diego County, Riverside, um, Orange County, LA, um, but to the north, there's still considerable amounts of behind the meter um, in the Bay Area. And what we find is that with utility scale installations, they're overwhelmingly in Southern California uh, as compared to NorCal. Uh, but with regard to behind the meter, it's about a 50-50 split between the amount installed in, in SP and the amount in NP. Um, and if you look at each uh, pie chart, the, the purple slice of that pie uh, is the amount of residential as a, as a percentage of, of all the BTM in, in each county. Um, and what you find is there's considerable residential build-out, and this is this is what grabs all the headlines on the nightly news um, in, in Southern Cal, uh, South, Southern California, um, you know, San Diego and Orange counties, uh, uh, the counties that tend to be pretty affluent. Um, but even in Northern California, what we find is the residential penetration of, of BTM as a percentage of the overall BTM picture. Um, it exceeds 50% for Marin County and areas in the Bay Area. Um, and even around Lake Tahoe, Placer County, uh, you're seeing over 50% of the behind the meter solar, rate, uh, solar generation being uh, residential in nature. So how much is out there? Well, that's a very good question. Um, looking at uh, the recent uh, KISO flexible capacity needs assessment from earlier this month, uh, they put the year-end 2013 amount of BTM solar at just, just under 1,300 megawatts. Um, and they're they're expecting another 700 megawatts or so to be installed this year. Um, so based on that, we can estimate what the behind the meter capacity is going to be this summer, and and we're pegging that between uh, you know 1500, 1600, 1700 megawatts this summer. So let's just try and put this all in perspective. Um, you know, what is the solar build up going to mean for the demand curve, and, and how Kaiso is able to deal with demand? So we're going to draw. Uh, actual demand graph from last year. So we're going to look at June 28th. Uh, this was a day where peak load uh, hit 44.9 gigs for KISO. Um, it's also a day that's very close to the summer solstice. So uh, the, the solar intensity levels are going to be one of the highest of the year. Um, this blue line shows the hourly real-time load curve that KISO is up against. And, and remember that when KISO reports load, um, it, it's there's a deduction for behind the meter uh, solar because that's that's canceling out some demand. Um, this next line uh, is if we took what well, it's what we call load net solar, which is if we took that load curve and then deducted the utility level um, solar generation that Kaiso reports. You can see it it does move the curve down quite a bit. So what happens if instead of 2013 solar install numbers, we assumed this year's, this summer's uh, installation levels. Well, first, let's look at the behind the meter portion of it. This green line represents the difference, um, the additional behind the meter solar that uh, is going to be in place this summer. And what this actually does is for the peak solar generation hours, around hours uh, 12 through 14, it pushes our load curve down about 600 megawatts. And for the peak hour, that gets pushed down 300 megawatts. So these aren't uh, you know, the smallest of changes here. And if we factor in the additional utility scale solar that's been built in over the last year, we get this purple curve. And you can see that's considerably lower than last year's uh, load net solar curve. Um, in fact, this year, uh, for the peak solar hour at hour 13, it's three and a half gigs lower. And for the peak demand low, uh, hour, uh, hour ending 17, uh, this year's low net solar curve is actually about two gigawatts lower. So uh, the additional solar build-out is uh, going to have quite an impact on um, 
how, how PICE was able to meet the, uh, the summertime demand. So uh, that concludes our uh, discussion of supply. I'm going to hand it over to Ross, and he'll talk about demand. Thank you, Dennis. To begin the demand section, we'll take a look at uh, historical demand and move into uh, what the weather last summer looked like uh, climatologically and move into our forecast section. So to begin, uh, we have three tables here. Uh, the topmost table shows historical summer demand peaks in megawatts, and I'd like to specifically call your attention to, um, to start to 2013, where we saw the lowest peak demand of the last five years, uh, under 45 gigs, uh, for the only time in the last five years, uh, KISO-wide. Uh, interestingly, it was the third warmest uh, in the data set, with Northern California coming in uh, 14th uh, warmest on record in the 119-year data set, and Southern California coming in the 11th on record, 11th warmest on record. Um, which is interesting considering that 2010, which saw the highest demand peak of the last five years uh, in, from July to September, did actually uh, come in the lowest climatologically, ranking 32nd warmest on record in Southern California and 51st in Northern. Uh, moving to the second table, you'll see the dates corresponding to these demand peaks. And as you can see, PG&E typically experiences a pre-September peak in demand, uh, while SCE and SDG typically see that peak occur uh, in the September time frame. Also in this table, you can see a subtle shift uh, springward in this peak demand, as uh, initially in 2009, 2010, and 2011, we saw a late August, early September peak. And uh, as the years have gone by in 2012 and 2013, that shifted earlier. Uh, to last year actually peaking uh, July 1st. So an earlier shift. The last table, um, as you can see, is cumulative demand. And uh, cumulative demand follows climat climatology uh, much better than any peak load value. Um, as you can see, uh, 2012, which was the climatologically warmest year uh, in the last five years, did see uh, the highest cumulative demand in the five-year data set. And the second warmest, 2009, uh, did come in second. So it does correspond much more closely with what uh, climatology suggests weather-wise. This is a look uh, at 2013 summer temperatures. And many areas throughout the West experienced one of the five warmest Julys on record, uh, as indicated by some of the reds and deep reds in the uh, July picture. Uh, values above 115 indicate a top five. And you can see the region in the black circle in the July plot shows uh, record warmth uh, in Southern Oregon and Northern California. This warmth moderated through August along the coast as well as in uh, Nevada and Utah. And again, we see Idaho in the black circle uh, experiencing some record warmth in uh, the August timeframe. September saw further moderation in this warmth with above largely confined the eastern sections of WEC and coastal uh, Southern California. The NWS Western region, uh, which largely consists of WEC, uh, on the whole experienced the seventh warmest July to September on record in the 119-year data set. Now considering precipitation from summer 2013, uh, after a dry start, uh, especially in sections of the Pacific Northwest, conditions did grow wetter as many climate divisions uh, in the Pacific Northwest set records come September, uh, as indicated again by the area in circle in black. Interestingly, the uh, National Weather Service Western Region experienced the second wettest July to September period uh, on record, surpassed only by 1983. This is a little bit misleading considering that July to September is traditionally a rather dry period. So even though we did see uh, exceptional precipitation for that time frame, it did little to mitigate the severe drought conditions in place. Taking a look at the change in drought status throughout the summer season last year, uh, the last drought update prior to July of 2013, uh, you can see uh, the biggest drought improvement um, occurring from the 2013 to 20, um, June 25th to October 1st map uh, occurred in eastern half of WEC and the desert southwest. 
while California experienced minimal changes as portions of the state saw improvement and some worsening uh, to extreme uh, drought conditions, as indicated by the table uh, in the right. You see 100% of California in the June outlook was encompassed in some form of drought or abnormally dry conditions, and we did see some fall out of the category, uh, as indicated by the bold 2.63 value in the nothing section for October. And looking at the other end of the spectrum at the D3 section, which denotes extreme drought conditions, we did see a growth in that region. Now moving ahead to forecast, uh, this is the national map for our Ju uh, June, July, August 2014 temperature forecast. And as you can see, coastal locations throughout WEC, uh, as well as southern portions of the desert southwest, in the greatest likelihood to experience above average temperatures uh, with Southern California, expect to see much above normal conditions, including the Los Angeles and San Diego areas. Now looking at a monthly breakdown of that um, regional forecast map, you can see that early season normal to slightly above normal temperatures will eventually lead to much above normal temperatures uh, by the time August rolls around. And once again, emphasizing that uh, coastal and extreme southern WEC is likely to experience the greatest departure uh, from normal with interior regions uh, most likely to see normal to even slightly below normal uh, temperature conditions. Turning our focus now towards uh, precipitation, this is the July, June, July, August uh, 2014 Genscape precip forecast. And we do expect areas throughout eastern WEC including the Four Corners region, to see much wetter conditions than normal, as well as interior sections of the Pacific Northwest. Considering California, uh, the majority of the state, state extreme northeast portions, can expect normal precipita precipitation conditions to prevail. Now breaking this down monthly, uh, you can see that after beginning the summer with the majority uh, of the WEC region experiencing normal to slightly below normal uh, precipitation. Conditions do grow wetter uh, by the time the August time frame rolls around. Additionally, coastal Southern California uh, will stand the best chance to see prevailing below normal conditions. Uh, this is less than ideal for areas already experiencing uh, severe to extreme drought. Taking a look at the year-on-year -year changes in the drought status, the left shows the uh, western region uh, May 14, 2013, and where we stand on the right uh, as of the latest drought update from the U.S. Drought Monitor. And the table in the bottom left shows California yearly drought change year-on-year, -year, while the table on the right shows the western yearly drought change year-on-year. Uh, -year. From last year, uh, the worst drought has shifted out of the eastern WEC uh, including Colorado and New Mexico, into Western WEC, uh, primarily California and Nevada. As of that most recent update, uh, it's quite staggering to know that uh, California's experience, all of California, is experiencing either severe, extreme, or exceptional drought, as indicated by categories uh, D2, D3, and D4, uh, with approximately 25% of California being categorized in the highest level of uh, drought severity, the exceptional drought category. Now moving into the Climate Prediction Center drought expectations from present through August. Uh, as you can see in the west, the areas highlighted in red indicate a persistence or intensification of current drought conditions, and this encompasses the areas most heavily hit by drought uh, in the current state, if you'll recall. Uh, uh, previous slide. The above plot shows the CPC ENSO consensus forecast, which outlines uh, an increasing probability for El Nino conditions as we move through the summer. By the time August comes around, we do anticipate a 65% likelihood uh, of El Nino, and September that likelihood increases to 70%. This growing confidence in El Nino conditions helps shape both temperature and precipitation expecta expectations for our summer outlook. And uh, this, this uh, prevails into September, uh, where similar patterns emerge uh, as presented in our June to August outlook, 
uh, with respect to both precip and temperature. Uh, continued wet conditions are expected around four corners in the eastern WEC uh, and normal to slightly below in coastal and western sections, uh, while California uh, will likely continue to experience above average temperatures and four corners in the eastern WEC uh, with that enhanced precip is likely to see below average temperature conditions. That concludes the demand section, and now I'll be passing it off to Chris DaCosta to discuss transmission factors. Thank you, Ross. Uh, now let's start with a quick look at some of the major changes in transmission. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, they're primarily driven by uh, updates in renewable resources. Uh, one of the largest uh, additions to the transmission system uh, in WEC was the uh, build out of the 230 KV Montana Alberta tie. Uh, its capacity is about 300 megawatts and power is expected to flow in both directions um, but the primary purpose of this line uh, was to allow for greater wind growth in western Montana. Uh, additionally uh, there was some new uh, substations added uh, between the PV Beavers line and it's actually been broken up into several segments. Uh, they've inserted 500 kV substations uh, between the original PV Devers line such that uh, there is now one PV Colorado River uh, 500 kilovolt line and then two uh, Colorado River Red Bluff 500 kVs and two Red Bluff Deaver 500 kVs. Uh, and the overall purpose of this addition uh, was to allow for the large build out in solar generation primarily in the Blythe area. Um, but really out in the uh, deserts of Southern California. Uh, and uh, it allows for the uh, additional solar generation that we talked about earlier uh, to reach the populated coast uh, through one of the larger transmission segments uh, that was already in existence. Now let, let us get a sense of some of the, how some of the fire potential uh, relates to uh, the Western transmission system overall. On the image at the right shows a transmission map from WEC uh, with a map uh, that overlays the fire potential uh, with red uh, equaling sustained risk and the striped uh, indicating increased risk. Uh, now the past couple of years uh, drought has been an issue uh, and sometimes it can seem like it's a broken record uh, but it's important to note that as the drought continues the risks of uh, fire actually increases. Uh, so the last three years have taken a toll uh, on some of the vegetation uh, out in the, the forest there. Uh, and so it creates the situation where many areas will actually have a higher receptivity uh, to ignition. Uh, and the wildfire risk is not just an issue for uh, Southern California. Uh, it's actually uh, impacting uh, potentially both Northern California uh, Packy and uh, all the way up into southern Washington. Uh, if you look at the map at the right, I've circled some of the key locations. Uh, the top uh, is where the, the terminus of knob lies, uh, with the then the second circle indicating the California Oregon border, uh, where Packy uh, basically starts in front of in, in northern California. Uh, that central uh, central California coast. Uh, that's Diablo. Uh, that is also at risk, as is that last circle at the very bottom, uh, which primarily encompasses all of the LA Basin and uh, northern San Diego, uh, all the way through the coast. Uh, now, let's start with a quick look at uh, what actually happens uh, when this occurs. Uh, last summer, we actually saw this fire risk become realized. Uh, in around August 17th, uh, the government flat complex uh, fire uh, threatened high voltage lines near the Dells, uh, which includes the northern terminus of Knob. Now, looking at the uh, impacts on Sunday, uh, August 18th, and then Monday, August 19th, uh, the graph at the left shows the day ahead uh, scheduled flows indicated by the uh, brown dotted line uh, and then the red is the constraint. So if you look at this, it looks like um, they ran the day ahead market without any constraint, uh, only for it to be constrained in real time. Uh, and then looking at the resulting price impacts, uh, on Sunday the 18th, 
uh, day head prices at SP uh, cleared just shy of $44, uh, whereas there were very sharp spikes in real time uh, immediately following the D-rate, uh, such that real time prices ended up settling at $133. Uh, and then the same thing happened at Monday, uh, where they didn't anticipate uh, having to leave the line D-rated, uh, so they ran the day ahead market again with uh, now completely open, uh, resulting in a day ahead price on Monday of $46, only for the same situation to occur uh, with SP uh, prices uh, settling at $107 uh, in real time for that Monday. Uh, and, and just of note, this fire risk has actually already been realized this year, uh, last week in fact. Uh, there were fires in San Diego, and one of the fires, the freeway fire, uh, resulted in the ISO issuing a statement uh, restricting maintenance in Southern California, and there were some congestion uh, in the Northern San Diego area as a result. Uh, now looking at our power flow forecast uh, for the summer, uh, we expect a high utilization rate of the tides from the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, we're actually calling for a utilization rate of about 77% on PACI uh, and 70% on NOB for Q3. And June is actually showing even higher utilization rate of nearly 100%. Uh, and as looking at last year, uh, we saw what can happen uh, when prices in August, to prices in August when uh, NOB, which doesn't have nearly as high of a utilization rate uh, late in the summer as it does in the early summer, uh, can have the impact it can have on prices. Uh, so that fire risk is very real indeed. Uh, helpfully, uh, the growth in monitored uh, facilities uh, out in, in west, in the western portion of the country, uh, has, has allowed for uh, better analysis uh, regarding uh, congestion overall and really uh, supply in general, um, especially important when uh, a lot of the grid changes that we've seen and some of the supply changes that we've seen uh, with regards to solar have been impacting the grid. Uh, much differently uh, this year uh, than previous years. Uh, and, and looking at several uh, important nomograms uh, that have significant impacts on LMPs uh, across the state, uh, we do monitor uh, numerous uh, tie lines and units uh, that help us figure out what some of the drivers are behind this congestion or some of the reasons why it's occurring. Uh, in dub note, uh, as I mentioned before, solar is uh, really having a pretty large impact on the dispatch of, of a lot of units, uh, primarily in Southern California, uh, with Mountain View being a very good example. Uh, it's been primarily running across the uh, morning off-peak period uh, through right around hours ending uh, 9 and 10, just prior to solar re really hitting its peak, uh, and then dropping out for the remainder of the day, uh, and that includes the uh, evening peak. Uh, and that is something that wouldn't have been expected had we not had insight uh, into that unit specifically and then other units uh, in California as well. Uh, and now, uh, finally, let's look at the uh, top ten constraints for each of the past three years uh, based upon the percent of hours uh, constrained in the day ahead uh, market from June to September. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are many constraints that are uh, regulars to this list, uh, and, and that is primarily due to seasonal flows, uh, and, and primarily those are the PACI, NOB, and, and Cascade uh, constraints. And uh, of note, uh, I did actually uh, look at uh, these top ten constraints, not including June, uh, and PACI, NOB, and uh, Cascade also made all of those lists. Um, some of the uh, other uh, key things to look at, uh, primarily uh, in 2011, uh, it was a strong California hydro year. Uh, so many of those constraints that you, you typically see, uh, primarily again in, in June and oftentimes trickling into July, uh, those are a non-factor this year. Uh, also, uh, non-factors are all of the SCE PCT uh, hours, uh, as we have mentioned before, uh, but it's also worth uh, re-mentioning. Um, SEPCD is no longer being enforced in California uh, as of last November, I believe, uh, and so that takes that removes a significant portion of 
the uh, congestion in across the summer, um, really across the entire year, but also uh, in the summer, uh, which provides a lot of upside to uh, SDE overall. Now, uh, what we do expect this year uh, are the reoccurrence of the now Packy and, and Cascade uh, congestion, uh, primarily in June and July, uh, but also trickling into uh, the end of the summer as well, uh, due to uh, strong hydro uh, runoff. Um, and uh, looking uh, farther south, uh, we expect uh, east to west congestion in Southern California uh, as strong renewable penetration uh, has continued to grow. Uh, and so a lot of that solar that you see uh, being added to Southern California uh, needs to reach the uh, unpopulated areas or the populated areas uh, on the coast. Uh, so ever since Songs uh, was no longer in operation, we've continued to see uh, congestion in that uh, LA uh, basin area, that southern portion there, and northern San Diego. Uh, and that is ex expected to per persist as the energy cost of the solar generation uh, pushes down the overall cost of energy across the state, uh, potentially pricing out some of the thermal units uh, in the more uh, populated areas. Uh, now, just to reiterate some of the key uh, things discussed on this presentation, uh, the implementation of the CAISO 15-minute market uh, that has really changed, uh, definitely changed, uh, virtual bidding strategies uh, overall. Uh, also, uh, of note to keep on harping on is the uh, lower amount of California hydro uh, generation uh, this year relative to really previous years, um, but a lot of that is being replaced by solar generation, which has a much different uh, profile overall uh, and much less dispatchability. Um, Price-wise, uh, no SDE PCT, uh, so that uh, positive SPNP spread uh, should converge uh, solely based on that. Um, huge risk, I feel like we've been mentioning this every year and it continues to hold true uh, on wildfires, uh, which as we've shown, uh, leads to some pretty large uh, risks to the transmission system overall and pricing risks uh, when you look at uh, the uh, cost to, to turn on some of those more expensive generators uh, along the coast where the populations actually lie. Uh, and the drought conditions continue. Uh, so that wildfire risk is expected to hold through the remainder of summer. Um, but El Nino is on the way, uh, which should uh, bring some precip to California, um, possibly uh, by very late summer, um, but uh, the winter especially. Uh, now, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to ask them. Uh, you can type them into the box on the right-hand side of your computer. Question. So we, we do have a question. Um, do you see any um, effects um, of, with these trends of that, that might lead to PV uh, Palo Verde uh, coming off? Palo Verde, the nuke or the price? The, the nuke. <laughs> Um, I don't think we do, uh, just given the, the nature of uh, PV, uh, the nuclear center there, they use recycled uh, water, so they really, it's all in-house and um, the drought conditions shouldn't affect it at all.
Yeah, we have one more question here. Um, what sort of model do we use for our WEC model? Is it deterministic or quantitative? It's actually a, a production cost model that employs the, the SCUC methodology, you know, security constrained unit commitment model, and it's, uh, it's ran with Genscape's proprietary inputs on the Plexos platform. There's a one, one last question. Um, somebody's saying on the slides about drought, how does NOAA define the stages of drought? So uh, the drought monitor uses a combination of uh, both subjective and uh, objective input, the subjective being uh, expertly trained observers from around the country, um, objective, a few different metrics, uh, including the Palmer Drought Index and uh, USGS, uh, that being geological survey, uh, stream flow data. Okay, I think that about wraps it up. I wanted to thank everybody for dialing in uh, this afternoon for our webinar and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks.